by doing world music many times, <laughs> um, or um, like the tension that's been going, or the kind of Twitter dialogue that's been going on around um, Iggy Azalea and Azalea Banks, um, Q-Tip and all these different people weighing in. It's something that is like kind of always at the forefront, I think, of um, pop music and especially rock and hip hop musics. And I want to make sure that we um, find a way to talk about that when we're talking about queer music as well. And I feel like for me, I really wanted to use this venue to talk about the politics of cultural appropriation because I feel like um, this Austin queer music subculture is my subculture. And there's a lot of tension, I think, around issues of racial appropriation um, and racism in our subculture. And I want to like make sure that we make opportunities to keep processing and keep keep talking about it. Um, and so, you know, a lot of that has crystallized around Christine, um, and particularly um, the way that that Christine is a, a white performer working in a hip hop idiom, um, and um, using certain signifiers of blackness like the gold tooth, um, or certain kind of hip hop signifiers like the tooth, um, and so. I know we've had conversations about this. We had the town hall last year, but I wanted to make a space to kind of talk about cultural appropriation and say, like, is there a middle ground between, like, all appropriation is bad um, and no one should appropriate anything from any other cultures or there shouldn't be any, like, um, and, like, everything is up for grabs. You can use it and take it out of its historical perspective and use it however you want. Mm. Um, and if there is some middle ground, like, can we kind of talk about like how we would define that middle ground? <laughs> like, um, and I just want to, um, as a white person, say, like for me, this is a really real question um, as an academic because my first academic work was around Paris's burning, and um, a kind of identification with the performers in Paris's burning that I think then caused me to go learn a whole bunch of stuff about African American culture so I could understand like what was going on in that movie and so I think um, you know I'm really I'm asking this question from a perspective of being really open to the radical potential of cross-cultural borrowing but also wanting to say like um, obviously not all borrowings are created equal. Um, so like what makes something respectful, productive, and not exclusive feeling? Because like right now I feel like in our music subculture a lot of people feel alienated and left out. So I'm not gonna say like I don't think we have to go around and like do the everybody <laughs> but I just want to kind of let people respond and um, share some thoughts about that if you have some thoughts about cultural appropriation and borrowing. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I always say, yeah, punk is based on black blues a few generations back, but what do you want me to do? River dance? <laughs> Legally, that's all I might be allowed to do. I mean, you know what I mean? And then I'm not into it, so then I don't do anything. Okay. So. I think what I want to keep in mind is attention, awareness, listening, uh, talking to people about like what works for other people, and, and really like how to, if, if we're going to incorporate each other's culture and make like something really interesting and new, then how do we make each other feel welcome at our art? event, you know, or art, art project, you, you know, without tokenizing. You can't be like, well, I have this one black friend, you, play, you know, you can't do that. So how do you, what do you do? Well, I'm going to go to this event that I know I'm going to be the only white person there. And I'm going to stay in the back and maybe I'm going to talk to a few people afterwards and then maybe invite some performers to come to my thing and see, you know, so that what, what I don't want to have is like, all people of color on stage and all white people in the audience or like have one person of color or one trans person like in my band you know so what can I do and and it can be really challenging because I can reach out I can reach out I can reach out and at some point you know I, I'm like okay 
I don't have any trans people of color pals that want to be in my gypsy punk band. <laughs> I, I, okay. And, and maybe I can get some, uh, some diversity to come in, like, <coughs> in on a song once in a while. Create a format, like, where people could just come in and do a song every show. You know, you have different people come in, and it's just really open and community-based or something. But we're going to have to use our imaginations. We're going to have to come up with some new shit. And if we do want to incorporate other people's cultures into our art, then we have to do it with attention and respect and admiration and name the people that we got it from. Yeah. You know? And say, like, I know what I'm doing, and I'm actually doing this as an homage, and, um, and here's how I'm, I'm queering it. And be willing to discuss it and be willing to take criticism. Mm. Mm. You know? Uh, I think one of the scariest parts of being an artist uh, or being anyone, anywhere, is to be able to take criticism and be fluent and be willing to change. That's good advice. That is the I don't know what's advice. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm like, um, one of the things I kind of do post making music is I do a lot of performative work and like a new piece that I'm working on. I'm, I'm showing a, a recent piece on Saturday night, it's a dance piece. Um, that I choreographed, but a new piece that I'm working on is an ensemble piece with three dancers, and I'm trying to decide how I want to cast it. And it's all these kind of questions are coming up, and not you know wanting something that that embraces a lot of different ideas and different um, races, different you know different um, gender construction, but how to do that with also not feeling like you're putting together like a Benetton ad. You know, where it's like you're emblematic of all these different, it's just, it's, I think that's really the best advice you can is like, be open, try it, have the conversation, talk about it. Because on an intellectual level, when you're talking about appropriation, everything is up for grabs. And it should be, and we should, you know, it should be an open conversation, and the only way to do that is to, to throw it in there. I mean, if you're if you're if you're too resistant or you're too <coughs> back and being afraid of like I'm afraid to try this because I might offend this person or I might step on this person's you know feelings like then the conversation it's not gonna you know it's not gonna change it it's not gonna happen so it's something I'm thinking about a lot so Dude, I'm gonna let the see, see if um, Max and Gretchen want to say anything before I start letting people from the audience chime in. <laughs> say some words. Um, I know for hip hop, it's like a really big thing right now. Um, like you mentioned with uh, Zelia Banks and Iggy, and um, for me, it's just I don't know. It's kind of hard to say what the rules are for appropriation. Um, not to say that there even are any rules for appropriation. I, I think um, it's all about kind of. Like you said, how it comes across, is it respectful, is it tasteful, does it seem like something, you know, unique to your perspective and kind of like how you put it together. Cause for example, um, when Eminem came out rapping, he's one of my favorite rappers, you know, uh, definitely in my top three. And it's because when you hear his stories, when you hear his music, you, you know it's the truth, you know it's, you know, again, authentic. and you don't even think about, oh, is, uh, well, he's not black, or, you know, that's not e that doesn't even come across your mind. You know, but when you see um, things like twerking, which comes from, again, from Bounce history, uh, and, and Miley Cyrus did, and a lot of people freaked out about it, it was probably <laughs> because it kind of seemed more like um, a mockery to some people versus, mm -hmm. like, a true, you know, I'm... I'm doing this dance and you know it I, I researched it and like I really you know really wanted to go out and do it you know I didn't I didn't think it was a joke or anything and not to say that's what Miley Cyrus thought it was you know and I think people kind of get caught up in like um, again like kind of afraid to step out and just do it and I think that if you know that your purpose and you know that you're doing it with you know the intent to create something unique and you know creative uh, then it doesn't even cross your mind and it doesn't even cross the audience's mind that you're doing something, you know, different or you're pulling from other cultures. Um, for example, I listen to a lot of uh, Hector Lavoe, 
uh, which is, who's a you know big time salsa singer. They even say that he invented salsa. And so I listen to his music all the time and I pull a lot of different things from there, but like no one would even like notice or even care to pay attention to it. And no one, you know, says I'm trying to, you know, jip off of, you know, Hispanic culture or anything like that. It's just because I, I truly respect it. And I, you know, I feel like it all kind of depends on how it comes across to the audience. And, you know, there's room for, in music and creativity for everyone, you know, and hip hop is not a, you know, it may have been birth, you know, from the black community, but it's not, you know, just for black people or just for, you know, this people, you know, it's, it's a creative expression. And, um, and I think that everyone should be able to creatively express themselves. And there's no boundaries for that, I feel like. Um, and like you said, if you're if you're paying respect to it and you're saying where you got it from or you're saying what you were inspired by, you know, then it makes a huge difference of like how it comes across, I think. Mm -hmm. So as an English professor, I really like it when people cite their sources. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and uh, uh I think you raised a really good point, which maybe has been missing from the conversation so far, when you're talking about Bounce and Miley Cyrus kind of um, taking twerking um, out of its context. And that's, I think when we're talking about people borrowing from hip hop, and especially queer people, because a lot of times queer people want to talk about shame and sexuality, um, is like we have to keep in mind this context that black women's bodies have been um, cast historically as overly sexualized and uh, sexual objects that are kind of free for the taking. And also black men have been, you know, portrayed in our culture as these like um, sexual beasts um, whose, you know, desires can't be contained. And so there's a lot at stake taking something like um, twerking, which is like, has a particular New Orleans um, cultural context and putting it up the Grammys or whatever without kind of thinking about how, what ideas people already have about black femininity, um, be, you know, that they're bringing to it maybe because they haven't been in New Orleans experiencing what it means there. Um, I actually have to go teach a class, but I wanted to leave that <laughs> yes. with this idea. <laughs> maybe you can tell me, you can tell me what ends up with the conversation, but maybe introduce this idea of, um, well, you know, when we're talking about t taking influences from other places that may be separate from, you know, who we are, or different from who we are, and um, having license to do that as artists, and I, I'm down with that. I am curious though about the whole issue of, you know, white success with other cultures, um, you know, with, you know, minority cultures. Um, I'm thinking about that internet meme that's going around looking at how Macklemore has won more Grammys than, you know, Tupac and MC Light and you know, all that mm -hmm. stuff. Um, so, you know, does it become an issue when we see a dominant culture become more successful um, than the non-dominant culture you know, with their influences? And is it different if it's a queer white person doing it? You know, if it's a white person who's queer? Or a white woman who's doing it, is that different than a white man doing it? Is that different than a white woman, a white straight woman? Okay, so let me know. You know, I'll just say this. I, I really think that being human is incredibly difficult. You know, and I think, I mean, I, ne I have never been easy with it. With being a human and with being with other humans. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I mean this very seriously because I was fed a diet of Beatrix Potter and fairy tales in a world of um, fantasy and a, a places of escape that are very easy for me to go to that don't have to do with taking criticism, don't have to do with taking responsibility, and, and, and be, something being pointed out where it's like, okay, fuck. I mean, that never occurred to me. <laughs> I see your feelings are really hurt, and that like never crossed my mind. You know, that, 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 that feeling of, of being caught, of being busted, 
and the, the worst is if you've had this sort of gregarious moment of it and then, and then one receives that. But I feel like that that is just comes with the territory of humanity. You know, it just does. You know, it just freaking does. And we have so much to learn about being with each other. And I think it just is, I think it's inherently very, 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 very hard. And I do like to think that there's two things that queers have going and against us. One is profound defensiveness. So defensive. <laughs> so defensive. Because a piece of criticism can feel like an invalidation to the very core. Mm. And I also feel like a thing that queers can have going for us is knowing what the fuck it feels like to be the underdog as a, as a white person in a, a place where you're beaten for mm. being a queer. And so there can be, one can extend some compassion to, to other humans, but I don't know how it's going to look in some great happily ever after time. And I feel like Disney has done me a profound disservice. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, ser I'm serious because I sometimes sure. believe that there will be a happily ever after. And it's the second. This is freaking second. And it's the shitty seconds. You know, it's, it, it's, it's now and it's just a kind of ceaseless processing. But, 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 Everything you said about being open, everything that we're saying about that, with just the, and with this knowledge that there's going to be a desire for expression, and it, it's just it's inherently fraught. But would we rather, you know, would it be better if we didn't, you know, if we just? And then also, I will just say, oh my God, that whole Madonna appropriating thing. I didn't know. Whatever. <laughs> Until I saw her doing on the music tour this country western cowboy Texas thing. And I just was like, well, you got that all wrong, you know? She totally had it wrong. And I, I, I was like, oh, I really, you know, get what this feels like if it's all, if everything is fair game. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all yeah. fair game for, the, for my collage. Mm -hmm. And here's my collage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think all of us have some version of that of feeling like, wait, somebody co-opted my special thing. <laughs> yes. Kate hey, Messer, you got your hand up back there. Yeah, I wanted to sort of build off of Mocha's question and kind of dovetail a little bit into what Gretchen said. As we're framing this as queer lives, which to me is inherently subcultural, when did we start giving a fuck about the Grammys? The <laughs> yeah, good point. Seriously, yeah, good or point. MTV, or yeah. any of that. Like, and in terms of you know Madonna appropriating, we reappropriate from Madonna. We re-steal from Britney. We, mm -hmm. you know, punk punk rock aesthetics. We know we're built off of gay male aesthetics. You know, they were trying punks wanted to look outrageous. What's the most fucking outrageous you could look like? Mm -hmm. A Castro boy from the 70s, you know, and and the leather cultures and, and things like that. And so we have to kind of realign, I think, some of our mindsets when we're worried about all these academic brouhaha's about appropriation, this appropriation, that. It's like we're cleaning the table with a dirty cloth. Mm -hmm. We've been over these things so many times, and yet we have to reclean the washcloth every time. But Everything's about bricolage, especially in Western and American society. We are a fucking melting pot. You well, know, let me, can, I, can I like jump in and play off of your little yeah, history? Yeah, that you, Because, I mean, the other thing that is incredibly inspirational to punk is reggae. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Which is a, ho a homophobic culture for the most mm -hmm. part. But you've yeah, got like some folks within po punk who cited their sources and also performed with reggae performers and um, and brought these Afro-Caribbean music subcultures into their punk subcultures and some people who just kind of took the beat and didn't cite their sources and then that music was fair game for skinheads to use and like completely unaware that they're like you know bopping along to you know this Afro-Caribbean music while they're <coughs> eating Afro-Caribbean people. Um, so I do think I don't think it's just academic. Like I think it is really um, there's real stuff at stake in terms of like where this music goes and what kind of like utopian or not utopian work it can do. And um, well, no, no offense, but citing sources is like a real privilege. 
buzzword. It's, you know, people who experience culture organically and then vomit it back out as an artist who maybe aren't running into academic roadblocks don't know a damn thing about citing sources. Oh, well, maybe I'll say so giving props. Yeah. Giving well, props I mean, to the people or, who or inspire you. Or understanding what yeah. that even means. Yeah. Yeah. That they just understand it as an organic part of what they've experienced. Yeah. I agree but, with that. It's like ignorance. Yeah. You know, as an artist in high school, I thought my photographer was Annie Getty. I mean, that is a huge embarrassing thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> but it's because like, my teacher didn't show me as a great okay. artist. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so the first person to ask me, I said, well, I know. I saw the book at CVS. I bought it for my sister-in-law. I had no other like, names in my, in my fingertips, you know? So that was my so I didn't know what I was stealing from, but I was just stealing from probably everything, you know. It was, I'll just wrap up one little last thing. The best answer I ever heard posed to a musician um, with that tedious, tedious question that every, you know, junior Rolling Stone wannabe says, which is, what are your influences? And it was a member of NRBQ, and he basically said, I'm not only influenced by the stuff I love, I'm influenced by the stuff I hate. So everything I've ever experienced influences me, so I don't understand the point of your question. And he said it in a lot more fun, exciting, less... <laughs> you know, way, but it was basically making the point that you know my my influence is a reaction against as much as it is a reaction for. So you know I'm not going to cite sources of all the shit I hate or love. You know I mean it's just part of who I am. And, and yeah, I think it's important when it becomes cultural movement to embrace and invite in those elements that you have have been inspired by. I think that's, it's more about invitation than, than name checking and kudos and stuff like that. Okay, can I just jump in on one thing? On that thing, what the <coughs> Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, and those guys they like to like, Mm -hmm. Just take a nap music yeah. and you could die drunk in a fucking shack in the yeah. south while I live in a fucking castle in England. Yeah. Um, yeah. The way to fucking give back is fucking throw money at the shit, at yeah. least. Mm -hmm. Be like, hey, mm -hmm. thanks, here's some money. What do you need? 10,000, 50,000 bucks that can last you, dude? Okay, thank you. Dude wrote this song. Yeah, and then we did a cover. See, thanks. Yeah. Now people are just. Not only do you not say anything, but you make all the money. That's what we were talking about before. It's like Eminem or whoever's going to, you know, white people succeeding, white people getting Grammys, and then the other people that actually wrote the shit are like, you know. MC Hammer, everybody makes fun of him. Oh, you spend all your money, dude. Ha, ha, ha. It's like, well... Dude, it's it's interesting that we're spending, there's so much time that we, we, we could spend talking about race, but we haven't really got it into class at all. And class is like almost like an issue that's so much easier to have, you know, the, the discussion about because, I mean, that that really is a big part of of of, of queer core, I felt like. I mean, it's like I, I grew up with a single mother, I don't know my father, and like everything was a reaction against men and a, and, and a certain class of men, too. Um, and it's just you know it's it's a it's a whole different conversation I don't know and it's not not one you post but it's something that it's we can all kind of get behind I think in a way that is a, you know it's a it's an easier conversation I guess in some ways um, to to talk about you know the one percent and our hatred for them and, <laughs> and you know then. Then the difficulty that comes up with all the the, the, the discussion about race yeah. and gender, yeah. you know. So um, I'm gonna t like. There's a question back here. Oh, uh, um, I don't. I think it's sort of been addressed, and it was sort of you answered some stuff, but it was just talking um, while I'm on the spot. Sorry. Because <laughs> um, you were brought, you were bringing up class, I and mean, I keep thinking about hierarchy in the face of, and so when we're talking about, you know borrowing and changing it seems to be this sort of final final product. So when you were mentioning like borrowing from leather culture and this, it's like um, thinking about the exclusions, the people that are not included in some of these subcultural things as an element of it. And also like when you're thinking of Iggy Azalea or Diane Turret or any of these other groups that are using it's like the face still becomes white. Mm -hmm. The face still becomes part of the system. And so there's hierarchy that's created. So how do you elevate the faces as part of that representation? And so that's one of the things I was thinking of. It's like you have these groups, you have white on your skin, but then you have all these influences. And how do you 
on the larger thing. Like it, we're, it's it's going from like subcultural groups to a, a much larger publicity scale, and there's that gap in between. So that's so just how do you address that? How do you deal with that mixed in between all of this? I mean. Um, Take one more comment, and then I have one more question. So I want to move on to our last. Question. Oh, uh, <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, oh, it was really just kind of touching on what you were saying, and um, just I guess the the frustration comes with it when uh, when you're looking at class and race, and you're looking at you know these people who are like at the bottom, and they've been at the bottom all the time, you know, their whole lives, and uh, Nas, Tupac, you know, those guys who, you know, are his you know, historical figures in terms of hip hop, you know, and they have no Grammys and um <clears throat> and you're just looking at like if I guess it's it gets frustrating if you take and take from me <coughs> give anything to me. So for it for instance, queer culture, like the words we use and things we say, like uh for instance slay, that's like the do one that, you know, is now like a very general term people like if you're all dressed up and look nice and you're like slay honey like you know that's a get you know a gay term and now everybody uses it and it's kind of frustrating because you're like well i can't even get you know the right to get married but you'll take and take and take from me you know and i guess it's you have a you have the you know the license to do whatever you want in terms of creativity but i think you have to take into account you know where these people come from and what these people have been through and the fact that there's nothing ever, you know, you're never giving anything to them. We're not getting Grammys. We're not getting, you know, as a queer artist, like, watching Sam Smith get Grammys, you know, was awesome because it was just like, we don't get that. And finally, there's something we can have. And it's just, it's frustrating if you see people kind of taken from your sound or taken from your style and nothing ever gets returned to you. And like you said, you know, you have the big house, you know, on the hill and I'm still living in the slums of the ghetto and I created your sound, you know? So I think it's really important to kind of keep that in mind, you know, at least, like you said, it's, you may not know where your sources come from, but at least try not to be so ignorant about it or try not to be you know blinded by you know investigate like if I hear something I want to know what I'm, I'm like big on history uh, we did these things for work at uh, El Style and my thing was like looking back in the past to like bring things for the future and, and so I'm like big on history and historian so if I hear something I'm trying to trace it all the way back as far as possible so when people ask me what I'm influenced by or inspired by, I want to be able to put them onto this too. I want to be able to show them, you know, uh, break beat and, you know, all kind of other different things that I take from because I want to teach as well. Like, because I know people aren't hearing this. They're not hearing this on the radio. They're not seeing this. And those people deserve some credit as well. And so I, I think that's, the main thing with appropriation is to at least try. You know, with Iggy, she never really tries. She just wants to fight, fight, fight against it, and it's just, just listen. Like, this is where you got, just listen, and just see, and just learn with us. We're not trying to take it from you, we're just trying to get you to see where you got it from if you don't realize where you got it from. And I think that's, that's just a small part of it, but. Yeah, I think one of the great things about that whole Twitter conversation that's been going on around her is like all these people putting out this musical history, like in maybe for new generations of people who haven't heard it, saying like, oh, this is where hip hop actually comes from. <laughs> but, um, uh, it comes from a particular historical context. Um, well, I want to switch gears and talk about history. Um, and I want to take a page from literally the book of our friend Anne Svekovic <laughs> um, <laughs> and talk about um, queer music history. And I'm going to, I want to be a little bit literal and actually talk about queer core as a kind of specific <clears throat> historical musical moment. Um, and uh, in her book, Archive of Feelings, Anne talks about how traditional modes of doing history don't necessarily work for queer subcultures because 
you know, the things that are in traditional archives are like books that got published by known publishers, <laughs> or records that got made, or films that got made and distributed by um, these big institutions, or even, you know, great men, and the works of great men, and the documents of legal things, all stuff that doesn't necessarily happen in queer subcultures. Um, so we don't necessarily have those kind of officially recognized archives, um, but also some of the things that are really specific to queer culture around that it's organized around um, who we have sex with and who we're intimate with, and also organized around something that's very ephemeral, like our communities and our um, subcultures and who takes care of us when we're sick and brings us casseroles and, <laughs> um, you know, all these things that um, maybe are not going to kind of get caught um, in by the traditional archives. And so Anne talks about this idea of, like, the ephemera, um, which is in archives, the, the ephemera is all the stuff that, like, librarians don't. Like, it doesn't fit into any of their known character categories, you know? So, like, um, for me, I think of, like, the Ransom Center has Anne Sexton sunglasses. Um, you know, that's, like, in the ephemera collection. Um, <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask um, y'all if you were thinking about, um, and I'll, I'll open this after the panelists have a chance to answer. Um, y'all can answer as well, but... Um, if there was a piece of ephemera that for you kind of crystallized um, queer core and what it was, like, uh, let's like put it in our little historical memory banks right now and make some, make our little um, archive by just kind of maybe conjuring up a piece of ephemera. <laughs> oh, and I'll start. Um, <laughs> just to give you an idea. Um, Okay, okay. Man, you and Anne talking about these like concepts. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You're Jojo. But I yes. what? That would be yours. It's, it's a rubber dick. Jojo. It's a rubber dick. <laughs> <laughs> That's where to name it. That's where I'm going with this question. Okay. Is, is Lenny's rubber dick? <laughs> um, like for me, maybe it'd be ice to have. Uh, I. I went to college in Seattle, and um, I used to have a Chainsaw Records t-shirt. Um, or no, not a Chainsaw Records, a Candy Ass Records t-shirt. Mm. Um, the cat? The cat. In the, yeah. In the, yeah. Yeah. I wish I still had that t-shirt. I haven't yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's like one of my, um, because I was just like, Team Dresh was my band. Like, I was in love with them, and that, that t-shirt would be my piece of, if, Ephemera. Mm. <laughs> um, I would say the flyers probably yeah. is what I, I mean, because I'd made all of our flyers. I was the, like the main visual kind of person who was always relating to the band that way, um, framing it around images. And um, there's a really good flyer of like, <laughs> a 70s guy with his legs spread and a butt plug up him and I just like kind of drew all over um, it was for a show at the Castro Street Fair and we were asked to play a headline like a Castro Street Fair thing which was such a disaster and like, yeah. <laughs> just, I'm sure it was. Like, I mean everyone was like it was like a, like the, the classic Neil Young concert everyone was up front with their hands <laughs> and just like just I put that poster all over the cast. <laughs> it was just like, and it's so much of, that, oh, I think it's been there. Yeah. Here. <laughs> um, so much of probably what we were reacting against, too, was like, the, yeah, there it is. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's great. Main stage. <laughs> let's see, let's see, let's see. Whoa, that's fucking in your face, pass around. <laughs> so yeah, we were, we were, yeah, I was, that was what I embraced, that in your face aesthetic that um, was supposed to be reacting against to like what was like the mm. Castro Queens. You know? mm -hmm. um, they were, we were really, they were complete in antithesis to them economically and just like what we were into. And it was, that's I think a, a really interesting part of of Homocore is that it wasn't just against 
um, who, you know, everybody was sort of fighting against the, but it was also internal. There was like a lot of internal mm -hmm. struggles against people in your own community mm -hmm. that you were reacting against. And, um, you know, down the road, it sort of created a lot of weird feelings for me afterwards, like there's sort of an internalized kind of homophobia, but also like I, I was, I was serious about it when I, when I did it, I was like, I hate these people. Like these queens in the Castro with their shopping bags and just like, you know, just offended me on so many levels. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of what we were reacting to was um, the, the entertainment that they were into. And I was so, you know, like, you know, if I, I remember just saying, it's like, God, if one more drag queen gets up and does a Judy Garland song, I'm going <laughs> to yeah. fucking die. You know? like, <laughs> I'm going to fucking kill myself. Now I've come around to really love that. <laughs> but I was really reacting against that. And so that was a big, just that was a big part of what we, what we were kind of going for. I don't, I'm you too, you know, just, I'm sure just, you know, there was so much of it was reaction. Just like wanting to, we were really bratty and um, just, we, we encouraged that. You know? So anyway, that, I would say the flyers, getting back to your question. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess flyers. I love having, like, I used to peel flyers off hmm. telephone poles in the 80s uh, <laughs> and stick them up on my wall. And I still have them with the masking tape and everything else before <laughs> other people just tore them down. And I was like, how are we going to find out where the shows are? And then the internet, the internet came, thank God. But, um, but yeah, I would say ephemera. People, the first time I cut off my dick, I was confused about my gender. I didn't know if I wanted to have a dick or cut it off. I was like, anyway, uh, I'll work on that one. <laughs> I was going to go into my um, comedy routine, but I guess that's not work. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I was like, you'd have to sing the song that was about the blowjob before you sang the song about cutting off the dick. Because if you did it the other way around, right. then you would get and it was wrong. So, yeah. I felt, oh, damn, forget it. Never mind. Next song. Um, but anyway, so the first time I did it and I threw it to the crowd because they're, they're, I was wielding the knife. I was wielding the knife, but only had the one dick, so what was it going to do, you know? <laughs> so if I cut that off, I wasn't going to be able to do this song, or if I was, it just wouldn't be as good for the rest of them. When we were in Atlanta, so there was like a lot more shows, no dick. And I was like, after that, of course, I brought a bag of rubber dicks. But, you know, and then you can make a, a dick last like three fucking shows, you know, balls, dick, stub, I don't know what. But, but anyway, and then there was the time when we tried to cross the Canadian border and they looked in the bag of rubber dicks and it was like one of those Walmart bags and it was kind of all jiggling and then the one looked in and then they were all punched over looking in and the bag was jiggling. Uh, yeah, but anyway, so we got to New York and somebody was like, look what I have. And they had the fucking mm -hmm. balls or the dick mm -hmm. or something. They're like, it's on my altar mm -hmm. at home. And that's some like queer punk homocore fucking altar with a rubber dick on it. And I was like, that's really gross. I mean, I don't even know where that went after it left my hand. That was a gnarly ass fucking all ages fucking filthy ass pit. And you, okay. <laughs> but I was, I was honored that they thought that thing was important. And, um, yeah, I bounced many dicks off of people's heads from then on. It was a lot of fun. I do want to say, oh, about posters, though, and, and uh, who, who has power and who influences who and who's taking what cultures back and forth from each other. And one of my favorite posters was this, like, silk screen of Tribe 8 and Seven Year Bitch who played in L.A. And they were, of course, they were the headliners. They were the bigger band. They were all straight. That we knew of, because I think the drummers, you know, yeah, messed around. Yeah. <laughs> they made out with a couple people, a couple times <laughs> on the side in the back room. Yeah, so. absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you got a kiss from Valerie. Yeah. Valerie, man. Oh, Valerie, Valerie acted yeah. all the dykes wanted her. Oh, She's like, yeah. oh, so <laughs> but anyway, so their poster was totally an homage to like dykes. You know, it was like fucking gnarly death bitch, fucking machine gun, fucking dyke, just like. Rah! Is that my, like, timer that says shut up? Okay. But anyway, it was, like, send your bitch and try to and then this, like, gnarly chick pointing the machine mm -hmm. gun with, like, all these I fucking flames <laughs> coming out at the viewer. <laughs> it's, like, really bad feng shui. I had them in a while, and I was like, where can I put this where it's going to work? No, it's all about violence pointed at me. Okay. <laughs> Smash the sweat. But, um, anyway. So, straight people are also influenced by queer culture. Uh, oh, yeah. 
yeah. I think we're all influencing each other, and I think that the place that we want to get to is a place where we're all freely and lovingly exchanging uh, influences and giving homage to each other as we do. <laughs> My archive is massive. Um, I literally have been collecting since I was 14. So, um, and que queer court to me was already after the the early 80s, big boys, blah, 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 all this stuff, mm -hmm. post Tunis girls and all of that. So it was a little bit of a blip for me. It wasn't, it wasn't like, a, it wasn't this huge thing because there had been all that had preceded it. Um, so I have candy ass, chainsaw, you know, I've got tons of singles. I have a bunch of posters. I have all of that stuff. And I, I feel like, um, I also used to work for a fellow who dealt in movie posters, and the, that was a very early job of mine, was contextualizing work because he was selling collections to um, universities of this, uh, you know, ephemera that, that was not valuable at all because these movies had not done well. But mm -hmm. he was putting it in a context, mm -hmm. and he was selling $4 press books for 25 and that completely shaped my way of looking at what my archive is. So I would say that right now, what I'm extremely excited about is, are my negatives, my film negatives from, you know, being lovers with Teresa Taylor, who wasn't in the Butthole Surfers yet, you know, wasn't this face of, like, the lesbian in that band, on the very first Ludwig kit that I bought her that she was supposed to paint back, and she never did. Um, <laughs> you know, like a fuzzy fucking neg in our apartment on, you know, 11th. Those kinds of, what, what these negatives are going to mean in terms of already, you know, a history from, you know, circa 1982 on up, my five billion photos of Lynn Gretchen and Anne looking at each other lo lovingly, um, <laughs> and 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 very much what I'm interested in are are, are, are friendship networks that may may not mm. may not be known, um, just from when you look at, at Vanity Fair and you see that these these writers and intellectuals were um, you know sharing a summer home in 1923. That to me, all and you, who gives a fuck if it's even a good photo, which is my sort of caveat for not having to worry about that part, is that it's just really what the, what the, you know, who the players are, and I think that this intersection that 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 I've had my whole life, my whole creative life, is you know everything I dreamt of as a child to be able to be with people who were were you know were artists and who were making things. That's all I wanted, and it that you know. That dream has come true, and that dream is as sweet as I thought it would be when I was a kid. Um, and um, and who knows if a bass drop wildfire or a Katrina will wipe that archive out? Mm -hmm. I still have you know my my memories of these things, but I would like to see some kick-ass fucking posters and zines <laughs> and you know all of that kind of stuff you know housed someplace. Besides the house down mm -hmm. the street, where people, could, you know, sort of look through it. Um, Megs, I don't know uh, if you were born yet in the height of uh, queer core, but um, does it bring up anything for you? Just talking about the artifacts and uh, these pieces of ephemera. Artifact makes it seem really long. Like our petroglyphs. Can you relate? <laughs> Yeah, I was not around. <laughs> but I did, I I had this really cool um, David Bowie t-shirt that I gave away and I still regret it to this day. <laughs> it was pretty badass and he was just looking like himself with the, the hair and the tights and all the good stuff and he gave it away and I think it's a that shirt. <laughs> yeah. back. We should all just make quilts from our t-shirts. <laughs> stop, stop getting rid of them. Next year, the <laughs> queer crafting should be Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Right, your queer ephemeral quilt. <laughs> Uh, it's it's interesting you bring up effeminate law because the major um, academic institutions, which are archive, has become a very different thing right now. And when a, the curator at a major institution was looking through my archive, there's all the political stuff, all the you know, 
And then he went, oh my God. And he pulled out a Two Nice Girls t-shirt. Now, most people that I know would say, what? But this gay curator at a major institution, that's what excited him. The other thing was a 50s t-shirt that I had. There was a pop star named Johnny Ray who had a, a huge hit. And there was a photograph that circulated around him of him blowing someone. And there was a t-shirt made in 1964 of, of this. That was the second thing he put out. You know? And he went over the Madame New poster of t-shirt to pull out the Johnny Ray. So this ephemera, you know, I think that the queering of all this stuff. I mean, I think it's really important that we remember that as Linny said it in the very beginning about how the queering of what the dominant culture thinks is important. So the posters, you know, that, that fag bash poster, and there's so many of those kinds of, of posters, and they predate queer core. You know, for someone my age, there's a history beforehand. Right. Uh, and we we need to acknowledge that. But yeah. I'm really excited, and I hope that's, that you know Gretchen's collection gets to one of these kinds of institutions, mm -hmm. because that tells more about who we are mm -hmm. than a lot of the stuff that's written and published, even in academia. It really tells about our lives and how we, how we walk down the street, how we build community, how we take care of each other, and how we say, fuck you publicly, you know? Yeah, if any of you make it to Los Angeles, I really encourage you to go to the Wine Institute at USC. It's just, it's the most remarkable resource of, and collection of ephemera that I've ever, I mean, it's the biggest in the world, but then you can go in, you walk in, and see whatever, you know, make an appointment to see whatever you want, and everything's online. It's just, it really is, it's mind-blowing mm -hmm. how much... So, any, you know, down mm -hmm. the road, if you, mm -hmm. it's a great place to mm -hmm. die. Oh, believe me, believe me, I hung yeah. out there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't throw anything away. Yeah, don't throw anything away. Uh, <laughs> the best advice from my father: don't throw anything away. Surely there's a way we can queer this, right? And monetize. <laughs> Um, Corinne, I think you're kind of a collector as well. I, I'm wondering if you have an, an artifact that comes to mind. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, that's sort of hard to pick. To pick you one. You don't have to pick one thing. I mean, I guess for me, um, it would be. I have one of the first, um, uh, the Huggy Bear, uh, who was a. Riot Girl, Creek Horror Band back in the day. I have their like uh, record, which is one of the first things that introduced me. I just randomly came across it um, at a record store in Boston. Um, I grew up in Massachusetts, um, and I basically would always just kind of like probably a lot of people do go through the record store and look for anything that had like something that seemed like gay on the cover or something that seemed like. Um, not heteronormative, not straight in some ways, like as a young teenager. Um, and for me, like, sort of like, I'm not that young, but I was young enough that I kind of just missed the, the queer core movement in terms of being really, uh, being able to be a part of it. Because um, I was in high school, like in a tiny town, and I had no real access to it. There was obviously before the internet at that time and so forth. So my introduction was all like sort of by accident, like stumbling across 